good morning and welcome to the sustainability webinar series uh, for the sustainable forest management in Alberta presentation today. My name is Carrie Ann Kohler Monroe and I work uh, in the environmental stewardship branch of agriculture and forestry. We host this webinar series that aims to increase awareness and support of sustainability platforms in the agriculture and now the forestry industry because this is our first forestry uh, focus presentation so uh, this is uh, exciting and just a few housekeeping rules for the webinar uh, the attendees will be on uh, listen mode only so uh, we're aiming for one hour for the webinar and there will be a short survey at the end of the webinar if you wouldn't mind to fill out a few of the questions and also, if you have questions during the webinar, feel free to type them into the question uh, box at the bottom of your panel, and we will have a question period at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today. John Statt is a provincial forest ecologist for Alberta Agriculture and Forestry in Edmonton, where he provides ecological expertise to decision makers and also collaborates on a wide range of forest management related projects dealing with biodiversity, mountain pine beetle, climate change, wildlife and strategic planning. John has degrees from the University of Victoria and the University of Alberta. Previous work has included a stint as research biologist in the Canadian Forest Service in Edmonton, followed by nine years with British Columbia's Fish and Wildlife Branch. So, a wealth of experience and um, a topic of sustainable forest management in Alberta. John, I will pass uh, it on to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for joining um, us on this presentation today. Um, yeah, so this is the first forestry one. Uh, so I hope um, what I'll do is I'll just tell a part of the story of forest sustainability in Alberta. And I hope to do it in a way that's interesting to both the agriculture people listening and also the forestry people in our ministry. So um, there's a lot that goes on in forest management. So I just want to say right out at the, uh, at the outset, this will be um, introducing some uh, basic concepts of forest management, but also only an, uh, one aspect of it is as well. Um, I'm a forest ecologist, so I'll be focusing on some of the more biodiversity related aspects to forest management. Um, and as a scientist in the forestry division, I also want to link into some of the science that supports what we're doing in forest management. All right. so. Um, uh, just a quick reminder of the land base that we manage. The previous agriculture presentations have been probably largely focused on the white zone of the province. We're dealing with the green zone in the province and uh, our agency is primarily focused on managing the area outside of provincial and national parks. So the area mapped in green on this slide. So in much of the green area of the province, the province has entered into forest management agreements with forest companies. And these agreements give the companies the right to harvest the wood fiber in these areas. Um, they then have the responsibility to develop forest management plans and, uh, and also to uh, reforest those areas. The government retains the responsibility for planning in the forest areas outside of these forest management agreements. But the province and our agency does um, review and approve these forest management plans that are submitted by forest companies. So we are the forest manager um, for, for these areas. So uh, I'll start with a very brief overview of forest management in Alberta. Uh, indigenous peoples manage the forest for millennia, and this is a very interesting topic all on its own um, that I can't get into right now. So during the European settlement period, uh, forests were exploited for timber, they were cleared for farms, and the Alberta Forest Service was born during this period out of the need to control fires that were often caused by settlers. As the forest industry started growing, the need to ensure the sustainability of the timber supply resulted in sustained yield principles being adopted in legislation. The idea about maintaining uh, forests so that we wouldn't run out of timber um, through overlogging. <clears throat> 
and these sustained yields principles were adopted into legislation and this led to a significant evolution in the Alberta Forest Service to ensure fiber sustainability. In the late 18, 1980s and 1990s, there was an increasing realization on the contribution of the contribution of forests to many other values. And this led to the gradual adoption of what we call sustainable forest management principles. The forests are more than fiber and these other values need to be sustained too. And so this evolution to sustainable forest management has also led to an evolution in, in the forest management agency in the province. And now, of course, this agency, we don't call it the Alberta Forest Service anymore. It's uh, within uh, the uh, forestry division of, um, of agriculture and forestry. So um, what is sustainable forest management? So it has been defined in Canada by the Canadian Council of Forest Ministers. And in this definition, there are six criteria that range from the environmental to economic to social criteria, sort of the so-called three-legged stool of sustainability. So as I said before, there are many aspects to forest sustainability that I could discuss here, but in my talk, I'll be focusing on how we ensure the maintenance of biological diversity. Other aspects of forest sustainability that Forestry Division deals with include managing wildfire, forest health, reforestation after harvesting, forest genetics and tree improvement, maintaining a stable supply of tree fiber volume for harvest, and, uh, and other aspects as well. And all these things that I mentioned are all interconnected and they all affect biodiversity and maintaining biodiversity affects our ability to, to achieve these other values as well. So hopefully we'll have other talks in this series that deal with these other aspects of forest sustainability as well. Okay, so how do we actually address the maintenance of uh, biological diversity? So Alberta's forest management uh, planning standard is um, a policy or a, a document that provides Alberta's expectations on what a forest management plan should look like. So these are the plans that forest companies submit to the Alberta government to, um, to, uh, to articulate how they're planning on managing the forest land base and how they're planning on harvesting. This standard uh, requires companies to set objectives for three different aspects of biodiversity. Now there'll also be these plans deal with all the other aspects of sustainable forest management to those other five criteria as well. But here I'll be focusing on the conservation of biodiversity. And so these three different aspects of biodiversity, ecosystem, species, and genetic diversity are all um, dealt with in, uh, in the planning standard. And a strong emphasis is played on, is played on ecosystem diversity objectives for that first one. And the reason we focus on the ecosystem diversity objective it's because we've taken a course filter um, focus on maintaining biodiversity. The idea here is that if we focus on maintaining ecosystems as a whole, the habitats for all the individual species and the species themselves will also be maintained. This approach does acknowledge that there may be some species that require a species level focus. And so in Alberta, uh, you hear a lot about uh, caribou and grizzly bear and we do have species uh, species level uh, um, objectives for those species often in, in many forest management plans. So um, the planning standard um, requires a wide range of ecosystem uh, diversity objectives or course filter objectives to be set both at the landscape scale and at the stand scale. So in my talk today, I'll be just focusing on some of these objectives. I'll be focusing on serial stages, which are, which are the age of the forest stands, patch sizes of these forest stands, and stand level structure. My perspective is that if we get these three right, we'll be a long way to achieving the sustainability of biodiversity and in many other forest values. That's not to negate the, the rest of those objectives, which are, are very important, but I'm focusing on these three today. So how do we go about setting these particular objectives? So this is where this word that I had on my title slide comes in, ecosystem-based management. In setting objectives, we are for, informed by ecosystem-based management principles. And this definition from Quebec provides a good summary of what ecosystem-based management is. It's the idea about redu of reducing differences between managed forests and natural forests. And the assumption here is that if we do that, we'll create landscapes that contain all the diversity and irregularity of the natural forest 
So a current approach to reducing differences between managed and natural ecosystems is to emulate key ecosystem processes that shaped the natural ecosystem. And this is where another uh, principle, which we talk about, uh, talk about is, which is called the emulation of natural disturbances. As our forests in Canada are shaped by natural disturbances such as fire, emulating these natural disturbances in forest management is one way to create forest landscapes that are similar to natural forest landscapes. So here's one schematic of what ecosystem-based management looks like in a forestry context. This schematic was created by David Anderson at FRI Research. So FRI Research is a government industry academia partnership in Alberta that provides knowledge tools to manage Alberta's forest landscapes. And so we have partnered with um, FRI Research on many, um, on many research projects that deal with many aspects of forest management. It was form, uh, it's based out of Hinton and it was formerly known as the Foothills Model Forest. Anyway, this uh, schematic shows the linkage from forest ecosystem processes, in this case, uh, natural disturbance, um, which drives what the forest looks like, the forest condition, which in turn determines outcomes such as fire uh, and uh, mountain pine beetle risk, water quality, or caribou and grizzly bear habitat. These all finally determine what this means for humans, the economic and social consequences, such as timber supply, drinking water, grazing, and recreational opportunities. The idea here is that if we keep disturbance patterns, forest condition, and the biological consequences within the natural range of variation, you know, that box with the, the words NR, and the letters NRV in there, if we keep the, those uh, uh, attributes within the natural range of variation, the forest ecosystem will continue to provide the economic and social outcomes we want. So I've used the term natural range of variation. Oh, by the way, before I move on to that, uh, when I talked about the planning standard before, uh, the planning standard focus, focuses on forest conditions. So it focuses on these attributes of the forest ecosystem, such as serial stages, patch sizes, structure retention, coarse weedy debris. Um, and it requires companies to set objectives there. But the idea in uh, ecosystem-based management is to, in setting that we want to be informed by disturbance patterns and to keep them within the natural range of variation. So this concept of natural range of variation, I've illustrated here for three different uh, attributes that I talked about before. Uh, so in this example, I've shown old forest, patch sizes and structure retention and they range from low to high on these uh, box plots. And these are just uh, dummy graphs articulated that just kind of uh, show the concept so they're not based on real data, but they do show sort of the, the situation. So in the old forest example, the, the blue bars are the natural range of variation. So the range of old forest arranged through time from low, maybe 25% up to maybe over 50%. Um, it could be much, uh, could it be a very different range in different ecosystems. Um, patch sizes might have a much greater range because, of course, fires burn. You have very small fires and very, very large fires. So your range of variation for patch size in the uh, in forests may be very large. Structure retention, which is the uh, is which is what happens, uh, is the the complexity that is left within a disturbance unit, or sort of what's left after a fire uh, within the fire unit boundaries is also uh, a, a fairly wide range as well. You may have very little left after a fire or you may have a lot left after a fire. So those uh, natural range variation bars reflect that, that range. Now I've also included these little orange bars, which is the managed range. So that's what we actually um, manage too often. And this may not be by, uh, by intent, but just, by, just because of the practicality of what forest management does. So in this example, the old forest range is actually partially within the natural range, but um, often below it. And that's often, of course, because we primarily remove old forest in harvesting. Patch size distribution of, uh, is actually a lot narrower in the managed range because our cut blocks, they don't get into the hundreds of thousands of hectares that fires can do. And uh, so there's a, a narrower range there. And structure retention, um, May, may in many cases be outside the natural range of variation because um, of the techniques that we've used in the past, traditional clear cutting. 
So without actually setting objectives, you might actually be outside the natural range of variation. So the concept here is that if we, um, if we want to manage for biodiversity and if we want to see the uh, values that we uh, want to achieve out of forests be achieved, um, we want to be within the natural range of variation with our, with our managed range. And ideally also to be uh, not just in a narrower part of that range, but across the range. Now, there's many issues with, with this natural range of variation concept. It's a very intriguing one, but it's also very complex. And uh, um, I'll talk about some of that complexity uh, in, in the rest of this talk. All right, so I said I was going to talk about serial stages, patch size distribution, and uh, structure retention. So how do we end up setting targets in a forest management plan for these uh, key forest attributes? So first of all, I'll talk about serial stages. Serial stages are the successional or age stages that forests go through following a disturbance like fire that kills all the trees. Forest management plans must set objectives for how much young, mature, young forest, mature forest, and old forest will be maintained on the landscape. Each stage provides unique habitat types for different species. So the idea here is to make sure that there's not too little or too much of any particular stage, you know, to have them perhaps within the natural range of variation. So what information can we use to set these targets? Since young forest is created by natural or harvest disturbances, we can have the rate of harvesting be informed by the rate of the dominant natural disturbance, which in Alberta is usually fire. So I'll talk a little bit about understanding what, what is the rate of fire in, in, in the landscape. But first I'll um, have to discuss the fact that of course we know that fire and harvesting disturbances are very different kinds of disturbances. And so in this graph, um, I'm trying to illustrate that. Um, so in this graph, we see on the x-axis forest age and the percent area in each 10-year age category is shown on the y-axis. And the red bars show an idealized age class distribution created by harvesting forests on a 100-year harvest cycle. And here I just chose 100 years uh, to illustrate um, the concept here. Harvesting, uh, forest harvesting, we target the oldest stands first. And... Uh, we won't re-harvest the stand until it reaches the harvest rotation age. So in this case, we set that at 100. So if we set the harvest rotation age to 100, eventually you end up with a regulated forest with no stands older than 100 years. So if you contrast that to a 100-year fire cycle, that's actually quite different because a 100-year fire cycle means that in 100 years, fires have burned an area equal to the forest area in question. So we're disturbing the same amount in here uh, in harvesting and in uh, fire in this graph. But um, unlike harvesting, fires can burn all ages of forests and some areas may burn often and others not at all through time. So since some areas can escape fire, you can get a lot of forest older than 100 years. So in this idealized example, uh, a fire cycle of 100 years allows for 30% of the forest to be older than 100 years whereas none would be left in a 100-year harvest cycle. The point is here is that we need to intentionally set old forest targets in a forest management plan to ensure that old forest is maintained in a managed forest. And this target can be informed by understanding of how frequent fire uh, naturally was. So in this figure, I showed an idealized mathematical age class distribution based on a 100-year fire cycle. But how do we know what the fire cycle really is? And uh, I'll just uh, illustrate this in this uh, slide here. So getting the fire cycle right has big implications on how much old forest one might expect on the landscape. Here we have the same graph, but here we're comparing an 80-year fire cycle with a 160-year fire cycle. And it does make a big difference on the amount of older forest we might expect. For example, we would expect 54% of the forest to be older uh, than 100 years with a 160-year fire cycle, but only 28% of it to be older than 100 with an 80-year fire cycle. So when we're setting our old forest targets, we want to make sure that we're getting, getting the fire cycle right. So how do we objectively determine fire cycles to inform our forest management plan? 
So I'll briefly describe three methods that we use, and each one has its pros and cons. And I, I'm doing this, I'm getting to, into the weeds here a little bit, but it just illustrates a little bit of the complexity of, that we face in, in forest management and some of the difficulties we have in trying to make some of these decisions. So the first method to determine fire cycle is to simply back calculate the fire cycle from the forest age distribution on the landscape. So we have our maps of forest ages across the landscape. And then we just roll back the human disturbances and uh, in effect put the forest back there. And then once we have the uh, uh, so-called artificial undisturbed forest, we can back calculate what the fire cycle would have been to create it that balance of serial stages of old, young and mature forest. So the advantage of this approach is that it's fairly simple and uses readily available information. Um, however, the disadvantage is that it only shows one snapshot in time, you know, the way the landscape is right now. So is the landscape the way it is right now um, representative of the uh, natural range? And there could be all sorts of things that happened in the past that would put us in a situation where, we're, where, where it's not representative of the natural range. A second method is to go out into the forests and do detailed fire mapping by mapping fire boundaries based on field evidence. Then one can estimate the fire frequency that created the pattern of fires that we've mapped. This is also a good objective method, but it's also biased towards recent fires. And one of the difficulties here is that recent fires uh, eliminate the evidence of previous fires that they burned over. So as we go back in time, we get less and less evidence of what the fires looked like back then. So to deal with some of the, these limitations from the, the, these first two methods, some people favor using simulation modeling. And what these models do is they burn landscapes based on our understanding of how fires start and spread through topography, vegetation types, fuel conditions, weather, and climate. So you feed all this information into the model and then you can start burning the landscapes based on our assumptions of how fires work. So if we get those assumptions correct, and if we understand how fires burn, we can actually start predicting how, how much fire you'd expect to have on certain landscapes, when landscapes will reburn, and start getting an understanding of what the fire frequency will be. Um, these models can show long-term fire cycles, one would expect based on uh, landscape and weather, and are not limited to data from the recent past. Uh, however, like all models, they are only an approximation of reality, and they reflect our current understanding of how the system works. So therefore, there's, we haven't just adopted one approach. We have been using all three of these methods together to help inform our understanding of fire frequency. Once we have determined a fire frequency, we then need to determine what uh, such a frequency means for the natural range of variation. So that's the uh, bullet on the bottom here. Um, so what it means for the natural range of variation for forest age or other forest metrics, such as patch size distribution. This is usually done through landscape simulation modeling. We have partnered with several other jurisdictions, such as Saskatchewan and the Northwest Territories, and, and, and uh, forest companies across Alberta to create a new model to do this. And this is the LandWeb project. And I'll just briefly dis describe uh, some of the outputs of this LandWeb project. The uh, scope of the LandWeb project is the Western Boreal Forest, including all the forest areas in Alberta. The first step in this project was to determine the fire cycles across the study area. And this was done through an expert workshop process, which used data from those first two methods that I talked about on the, on the previous slide. So they used estimates from serial stages uh, of the current situation and detailed fire mapping. So you can see the fire cycles here in the forested areas. Uh, so for example, here, uh, uh, in, in the boreal forest in northeastern Alberta, we have fire cycles around 65 years. As we move into the foothills, you see fire cycles going over 100. And up into the higher elevation forest, you have fire cycles getting up close to 200 years. So uh, once you have that information, then the model simulates fire over long periods of time and calculates forest metrics such as age and patch sizes at hundreds of points in time. This allows, us, allows the natural range of variation to be estimated. In this example from West Fraser Hinton op Hinton's operating area, we see a map of one of these hundreds of points in time 
with recent fires in red and older forests in darker green. The box plots on the right show two example outputs of the natural range of variation. In this example, the green bars show the natural range of variation of old, mature, and young forest for both pine and white spruce. The red dots show the current condition. So in the case of white spruce, the, uh, there is currently a lot more young, um, as you can see where the, loc the location of the red dot, a lot more young uh, white spruce on the landscape than our estimate of NRV and the amount of old forest is at the lower end of the range. So how can this information inform how we set targets, um, or th actually this information can inform how we set targets for our next forest management plan? I say inform instead of direct our next uh, plan because forest management is a very complicated balance of competing interests. In addition to main, uh, maintaining biodiversity, we also need to consider fire risk, forest health issues such as mountain pine beetle, and the need to provide a, a stable supply of wood to mills. So this information, you don't just blindly try to follow the natural range of variation, but it can inform us of how nature functioned in the past, and if we want to minimize risks of going outside of that range, uh, where we might want to move in our uh, forest management plan objectives. So back to our planning standard objectives. The rate of natural disturbance informs the serial stage targets. But how is that disturbance patterned across the landscape? This is where the patch size distribution objective comes in. So it's another, uh, our second landscape scale diversity objective. So I'll talk about patch size distribution now. Forest management plans must set targets for the size of harvest areas, as well as for how much interior old forest is maintained. This is important to do as forest fragmentation by human development can have a big impact on biodiversity. So here again, our understanding of how fire creates forest patterns can influence our forest management planning. So this graph shows the percent of fires in each patch size class, uh, which goes up in size along the x-axis. So along the x-axis, you can see going from less than a hectare in size all the way over to over 10,000 hectares in size. So what this graph shows is that most fires are very small. Over 70% are less than one hectare in size. And you can see there's very, very few disturbances that are, uh, are actually over 10,000 hectares in size. But if you overlay a graph of the area burned, a very different picture emerges. So here, uh, the blue bars are actually, they're not frequency, this is area. Um, so it's very few, uh, so it's percent area. So if you were to think about all the area that's burned in the, in, in the province in a particular year, how much um, was in these different patch sizes. Those very few large fires account for the large majority of the area burned. In this example from the foothills, over 50% of the fire area is in patches over 10,000 hectares. So what does this mean for forest management? When you consider that our traditional harvest sizes in the past covered a very narrow range from 20 to 100 hectares, it becomes clear that our former traditional harvesting approach creates a very different spatial pattern in the long term than fire does. And this would have a big implications for fragmentation and biodiversity. So here's an example of how this understanding can influence the pattern of harvesting. Well, this example is from Western Saskatchewan. It reflects approaches that many Alberta forest companies are taking. Uh, this was no, uh, this took place in the uh, Mista Hay area north of Meadow Lake in Western Saskatchewan. On the left side is the traditional plan. This was the plan that uh, Mystic Management first uh, laid out for when they were going to harvest this landscape. Uh, and it, uh, it was a, the purple areas that you see on that one are all are, are the harvest blocks that were planned and the green and the light green are different ages of forest. So uh, they plan to harvest 2600 hectares of uh, forest with the average patch size of the harvest units being around 21 hectares and they would have needed 122 kilometers of roads and it would have taken them 15 years to do it. However, informed by this patch size natural range of variation principle they came up with a very different plan, uh, which 
uh, is labeled, which you see on the right here, um, which is uh, trying to achieve more natural patterns. Here, we've harvested the same amount of forest uh, in much fewer blocks. The average patch size has gone up to 84 hectares, but what is even more important is that the range of the patches have, is a much wider range from one hectare to over a thousand hectares in size. Here, we only needed less than half the number of roads to access it. And even more importantly, rather than doing it over 15 years, where these roads have to be active for 15 years, the, uh, the time period of harvest is only 18 months, a single pass into this forest, and then the roads could be decommissioned and deactivated. Um, and so you can see the remaining forest, that when we talked about interior uh, forest, there's a lot more large patches of, uh, of older forest left on the landscape. But economic objectives were achieved, and it was done more cheaply as well, because we didn't have to build as many roads, and we could do it for a shorter period of time. So um, this shows where the idea of being informed by natural range of variation can actually have beneficial uh, benefits for both uh, biodiversity and other values. So far, we've discussed the landscape scale, biodiversity objectives, the serial stages, and patch sizes. Um, the rate of harvesting on the landscape and the spatial pattern of disturbance on the landscape, uh, which are dealt with by those two objectives. Now let's move down to the stand scale and look at stand level structure or the diversity of structure within a harvest patch. So here forest companies are required to set a target for the area of unharvested trees within a harvest opening. These unharvested trees can be in island patches or in dispersed trees and clumps. And the purpose of uh, structure or stand level structure is to provide structural complexity and old forest attributes within the harvest areas. And the idea here is that we want to retain legacies of this pre-disturbance forest. Um, and this would allow the recruitment of snags and coarse weedy debris, which are important for biodiversity and uh, also to maintain wildlife habitat attributes such as thermal cover and visual screening. So fires leave complex patterns of surviving and killed trees, and these will vary by fire. Here's an example where there is a, a fire has killed most of the trees. Some of them have been completely uh, burned off. Some of them have, uh, the trees are still standing but killed, but in the foreground you can see areas of trees that survived. However, in traditional clear cutting in the past, we create very simple disturbance openings with very little of the pre previous forest retained. So very little pre-disturbance legacies are left. So what can we learn from remnants within fires? In one important study, we partnered with David Anderson, who I mentioned before at FRI Research in a project that mapped retention in 170 fires across Alberta and Western Saskatchewan. Uh, David Anderson carefully selected these fires as he wanted fires that showed natural patterns. So therefore suppression and other human impacts had to be minimal, which is hard to do because we do action a lot of our fires. Fires that are fought have substantially higher proportions of high mortality areas as we tend to be quite good at putting out the low intensity burns that leave uh, surviving trees. So uh, here we see the results of the study. Uh, we see uh, at the top, he mapped out the retention patches in two different ways, uh, the retention areas that are uh, connected to the unburned forest on the outside, but also the island remnants that you see on the right that are within the disturbance entirely. And then he actually looked at how much there was in all the different fires. So uh, in both of these graphs, we can see that the range is very high, ranging from zero all the way up to over 50%. And uh, so, so variation is the key. But we can see that the mean amount of retention, 26% of these matrix elements and 12% of these islands, uh, you, you can see that there's a fair bit of complexity on average in these disturbance openings. So, and while the patterns of fire residuals differ by forest region, and here we have, I'm simply outlining how much retention we saw in the foothills, boreal and boreal shield areas of the province in this study. When you look at the totals, uh, the total amount of re remnants 
left within a fire tend to be fairly similar across all these different forest regions. They're just patterned a little differently based on uh, because of topography and other factors. So um, many, so applying the, the this information, you know, the, these numbers to forest management is not simple. Uh, is not as simple as saying we need to leave 40% within cut blocks because fires. Um, are, you know, burn differently than how we do forest management. Fires burn all types of forests, whereas harvesting only targets a smaller part of the landscape. Many areas of the forest landscape are not harvested due to accessibility, site productivity, species types, and also due to the protection of water bodies, like we leave buffers along streams and lakes, and around certain wildlife habitat areas, such as uh, stick nests of raptors and uh, mineral licks. So many of these unharvested areas contribute to within stand block complexity. So what we want to do in our objectives in a forest management plan is to ensure that um, that uh, on top of all the retention that we're leaving behind by default, we're leaving enough additional to achieve our objectives of enough uh, structural retent, uh, structural complexity within the block. So I'll just show a few pictures of what retention looks like. Um, Here's one in the foothills in pine dominated forest. Here's another one in the foothills, kind of a different pattern that was tried out by the company there. This is in southwestern Alberta. And here's an example of retention in the boreal mixed wood in a deciduous dominated stand up in northwestern Alberta. And you can see here that the company has left small clumps of trees, but also some large islands of trees. So this understanding of the complexity of retention within fires has led to an increased focus in studying fire severity. So far, we've talked about fire frequency and fire size, but what's going on inside these fires? So I talked a little bit about the fact that fires do leave pre-disturbance legacies, but this varies a lot. And, um, but we, what we often do in our fire simulation models is that we focus on crown fires, like the one in this slide here, that are stand replacing disturbances. So we focus on fire frequency and making sure that our forest harvesting doesn't uh, harvest faster than the frequency of fires. But we're starting to gain a greater appreciation of the extent of low severity fires that leave many trees alive. And here's a low severity fire burning through the forest. It may kill some of the smaller trees, but the larger trees can often survive these fires. And certain species have thicker barks that can also uh, withstand the heat of these fires. And forest areas where low severity fires are common are often very open and structurally complex. But the question here for us as forest managers is, is how common were these low severity fires in comparison to the more severe stand replacing fires? Several recent studies have been looking for evidence of low severity fires in Alberta. And what they do um, is they look for clues uh, such as visible fire scars on living trees. These trees survived uh, at least one low severity fire in the past. So you can see here on these, uh, on these trees, there's these fires, these scars here. The trees survived and have uh, and healed over these wounds, but these scars remain. So if you were to look at a cross section from these trees, you can see the, the tree ring, so the tree tip is over here in the, in the center of the tree where the tree started growing. And, and in this case, the tree, in these cases, the tree grew out until there was a fire. I'm not sure if you can see the mouse as I'm moving it. Um, and then a fire killed the tree at this point in time, but the tree survived and then continued growing. And in, this, in the case in the bottom here, you can see there's two different fire scars that were created by two different fires, probably 30 years apart. So this tree survived several fires. And if you were to map uh, the, the, the extent of these, uh, these fire scarred trees in different areas, we can um, start getting an understanding of the frequency of these low severity fires. So this graph here shows six different research sites where fire severity has been mapped. And we can see here these dates and, the, and these black triangles show uh, periods of time where low severity or stand maintaining fires occurred fires that didn't kill the whole stand, but allow many trees to survive. And these locations are in, for this particular study was in Jasper National Park, and you can see low severity fires going back to the 1700s, which were picked up 
However, note that only two of the dates are more recent than 1915. These studies have shown that human fire suppression, which is good at putting out low severity fires, have, has likely altered the fire regime. So we, don't, we haven't been seeing uh, low severity fires in the recent past. Here you can also see the median fire return interval of these uh, of fires, both low severity and high severity fires. Another line of evidence we can look we can use is to look at how fire regimes uh, how fire regimes may have been altered through time it comes from actually a very unique source that I find pretty exciting. Over a century ago, over 90,000 photos were taken in the Western Canadian mountains to allow contour maps to be created. And 8,000 of those photos are here in Alberta. In Alberta, we've partnered with the University of Victoria in the Mountain Legacy Project to scan these high resolution photos and to retake these photos. So we're developing tools to compare these photos and quantify how the landscape has changed. One of the trends we are seeing is that of more forest cover today than in the past and, uh, more, and much less open canopy woodlands. The open canopy woodlands would have been created by low severity fire. So in this next photo, we see a, 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 an image from 1915 in Jasper National Park and a, and a photo that was done in 1997. And you can see here in the upper photo, a lot of open woodlands and a lot of grasslands as well. In the photo today, a lot of those open woodlands have grown in and many of the grasslands have been greatly reduced in extent. So um, these studies often lead to more questions than answers for us as forest management. Were these historic open forests and grasslands maintained by low severity fires that we are now putting out? And what should this mean for forest management today? Should we try to recreate these open woodlands through uh, changed forest management practices? What will climate change mean for the future of these forests? And will climate change alter the frequency and severity of fires? And then what should our management goals be in forestry? Are there management strategies we can use to make our forests more resilient? So um, the, the, these questions, there's not a, a clear answer there. And so this is, uh, um, this provides, uh, a, 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 we're right in the middle of trying to figure out um, the extent of these low severity fires in the province. And so that's uh, a current study going on and we don't uh, currently understand yet how um, common low severity fires were in the northern foothills of the province or in, in the boreal forest. But as, we're, as we do in more and more research, we're finding more and more evidence of them. And it does have implications on our whole paradigm of ecosystem-based management and emulating natural disturbances. Now what I'd like to do is um, look at the, an even more fundamental question in the whole idea of uh, uh, emulating natural disturbance. We know that uh, fire and harvesting are very different kinds of disturbances. So we've talked already about the fire frequency and the spatial pattern of disturbance and the uh, pattern of uh, surviving residuals within landscapes. Um, and all of these factor into the diversity of habitat features at the stand and landscape scales. So if we want to maintain biodiversity on the landscape, we need to ensure that this diversity is not removed or simplified through management. So, we've partnered with uh, several research organizations to do this. And so I've talked so far about the work we've done with the Foothills Research Institute or the uh, FRI research to understand the fire frequency, the patterning of fires and the amount of retention within fires. And, uh, and that has been hugely helpful for us in setting forest management objectives. And I've talked about how the research has challenged assumptions about fire regimes and the importance of perhaps low severity fires across the landscape and the importance of perhaps creating more structurally diverse stands. However, there's an even more fundamental question that we also do need to address is, um, is uh, which gets at the heart of the whole ecosystem-based management uh, paradigm. Um, it gets at the whole assumption of if we create the patterns or if we emulate the patterns of natural disturbance or of how nature patterns itself across the landscape, if we were, are able to emulate that, will we actually get the biodiversity 
that came with a natural disturbance regime. It asked questions about um, can we really emulate natural disturbances in harvesting? And if and does emulating fire patterns in harvesting actually result in biodiversity being maintained? Since we know that forest harvesting is a very different disturbance than fire, what are the structural and spatial attributes of forest stands that are really needed to be to maintain biodiversity? So um, we've started, uh, along with uh, several forest companies back in the 1990s, uh, uh, what's probably the world's largest uh, biodiversity forestry experiment, and it's called the EMEND experiment. EMEND stands for Ecosystem Management Emulating Natural Disturbance. And this is a, a study which is uh, uh, planned to take 100 years um, to do, uh, or uh, one rotation of the forest cycle. And this really gets at the processes behind uh, um, uh, 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 how forests function. It goes beyond the patterns to how the forest system functions when it is altered. So in this experiment, um, it's a controlled experiment with controls and, uh, and different treatments, uh, including clear cuts, areas where 10% of the forest was retained, 20% was retained, 50%, 75%, and 100% control. And it was done in different uh, forest types, in mixed woods, in deciduous forests, and coniferous forests. And it covers over the, air, the land area, 7,000 hectares, but it's got 1,000 hectares of actual forest treatments. And uh, this study is now over 15 years old, and we're starting to see some very, very interesting trends about how forests recover following harvest disturbance. And we've also got fire treatments in this study and how forests recover following uh, fire treatments. So EMEND has shown the importance of stand structure to many species. And uh, one interesting thing about the study is that it doesn't just um, look at the vegetation recovery. It also has, there's dozens of studies looking at many aspects of biodiversity from mosses, lichens, uh, veg uh, understory vegetation to birds, uh, many different insect communities, and, um, and looking at how those species respond to these different levels of harvest disturbance. And this is giving us an understanding of the kinds of thresholds um, of disturbance that species can tolerate and, and how fast they recover following those disturbances. So I'll end my talk at this point and uh, open the floor for questions. And I'll just um, uh, acknowledge again that this was just a talk focused on how we manage for biodiversity. And there are so many other aspects of forest management that I hope will be dealt with in future talks. So thank you for um, your attention. And uh, yeah, I, I welcome questions. Thanks, John. Uh, forest management is definitely more complex than I ever thought it was, especially because you did focus on the biodiversity um, aspect of it. Wow. There's a number of questions that come in. So I will ask you, um, what is the longest term in an FMA? And does the company take on the risk of fire cycles during their fiber harvesting term? Okay, so the forest management plans are 10-year plans, though they do plan out 100 years into the future, but they actually um, lay out blocks for 20 years, but the plans are done every 10 years. So, um, so that uh, there's constant replanning happening every 10 years. And the question about fire is that um, if a fire uh, burns more than a certain amount of their FMA area, during the period of the plan, we do actually replan that area. Um, a, a new plan has to be done to account for the fact that the situation has changed. And in terms of the risk, well, fire does remove, like they, these are area-based agreements. So if fire has removed a lot of volume, it does impact the company in terms of the loss of, of fiber volume. It, they, 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 they can't harvest something that's not there. So there will be a, 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 an impact on on their on the amount of volume they can harvest. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Are um, is prescribed burns being used to manage pine bark beetle infestations in Alberta, or more management using harvesting? So that's a whole uh, big question there. The, the issue of prescribed burns and mountain pine beetle 
has been studied to look at uh, how if first dry burns are a useful tool following mountain pine beetles to rehabilitate stands. Prescribed burns um, could potentially be used in advance of a mountain pine beetle infestation to reduce the amount uh, number of trees that are susceptible because uh, um, what's happened in many of our landscapes is we've allowed the forest to get quite old and that those are more susceptible to mountain pine beetle. So prescribed burning could be used to uh, reintroduce disturbance into certain areas to uh, reset or to, uh, to restore the balance of mature old and young forests. And that's been done in, at, a, at a relatively small scale in Alberta because it's a pretty challenging tool to use because the burn windows are, are not always very large. And so we've, we've used it in certain areas, but not at a scale that could really have a huge impact on, uh, uh, on mountain pine beetle risk. So forest harvesting really is the, uh, the biggest tool that can address mountain pine beetle risk. And there's several ways where forest harvesting can, uh, can contribute to dealing with mountain pine, pine beetles. One is through um, just in advance, creating a better mix of uh, old, mature and young forest. So there's not too much of uh, old forest that is highly susceptible to mountain pine beetle. And then once the mountain pine beetle infestation does happen, then uh, you can introduce, uh, har you can target harvesting to the areas that are infested. And, uh, and, uh, and, and take out the beetles while they are still in, you know, uh, prevent spread from, from those stands. And so uh, harvesting is done in, uh, at that time, targeting mountain pine beetle infected stands. And that has to be done within a year of the infestation because the beetles will emerge the following year. And I think this question of like mountain pine beetle and forest health, that is a whole interesting question which could have a whole, sec a whole talk uh, in the sustainability series. And, uh, yeah. Okay, um, here's a continuation question that, you, again, you might want to defer or just touch on. Uh, are unforeseen forest disease and pest outbreaks, example pine beetle, considered under this ecosystem-based management approach? Um, I talked all about fire, about emulating natural yeah. disturbances and fire. And uh, really, in this approach, we should consider natural disturbances such as, uh, you know, such as mountain pine beetle and uh, spruce bud worm and other things, because they do uh, affect the structural complexity of forests. So we're developing tools that allow us to introduce those concepts. Mountain pine beetle is relatively new to Alberta because it's more of a climate change related expansion of, uh, of the range. So uh, we haven't had a lot of mountain pine beetle here before, so we don't really know what it does in Alberta yet. So um, yes, we're looking at how uh, trying to understand what those, um, what do forests look like with natural with natural disturbances like forest insects and diseases, and how do they uh, create the structural complexity uh, that is important for biodiversity? So that is part of the research that is being done. Great, thanks. Um, how do you consider areas that were burned by indigenous in their management of resources? Uh, example, the burning that occurred uh, in the hummingbird area for buffalo hunting? Well, that's a really interesting question. And uh, you know, when we talk about natural disturbances, how do you, you know, what, what, what is natural? Because if indigenous peoples have been burning for their purposes uh, in the forests for millennia, um, Really, when we're talking about natural disturbances, we're having, we, we, we can't separate that from indigenous burning. And so, you know, really the landscapes have been human altered already for a long time. And the indigenous people burned in many areas, like you mentioned, like the questioner uh, mentions that one particular area, but they burned in many areas of the province, even through the boreal forest um, uh, to uh, promote habitats for species they wanted to hunt to maintain travel corridors between uh, uh, areas that they needed to travel in, and also to reduce fire risk of, uh, around their own communities. So they had a very sophisticated fire management uh, system that uh, I think we're only now starting to understand how significant it was. And uh, so, um, yes, it is something that uh, we have to uh, add into our consideration here. And it's when we talk about natural Really, we're talking about natural and indigenous burning. Okay. 
In regards to the forest management plans that companies submit to the government for approval, um, have they changed over time? And if so, in what way? Um, forest management planning um, has changed as we've changed our planning standards. So uh, in 2005, six ish, we brought in a new forest planning standard, which was strongly informed by sustainable forest management principles. To um, uh, Whereas the old planning standard was a little bit more uh, a sustained yield plan, more focused on just maintaining uh, fiber sustainability. And so we're still on this evolution here. So now companies set objectives on a wide range of objectives since 2006, but we're, we're still learning how to do this. So it's, it's a, a work in progress. So in some ways, we're still in the sustained yield paradigm where there's a, a real focus on maintaining uh, fiber secure, uh, uh, sustainability. But we're, as we understand um, uh, these other aspects, these other values, and how to set objectives for them, we're, we're uh, increasingly focusing on those areas as well. Um, but it's always a balance. Uh, and so the, the plans reflect um, the social, economic, environmental uh, context that they're created in. So for example, with the mountain pine beetle coming in, that did have an effect on forest management plans as we as we had to focus on dealing with um, with, with with this infestation that was uh, changing our pine forests very dramatically and creating significant risks. And now with some of the fires that we're having around communities such as Slave Lake and Fort McMurray and other areas, um, you know, dealing with fire risk is going to be uh, obviously a very important factor in our forest management plans. And so I I, also, I expect to see continual evolution of forest management planning. That's good. This is probably a, a continuation of that answer. Um, how would the addition of additional trees to the forest be handled? Some political parties, parties are promising a significant addition of trees. Um, yeah, I, I don't know about the, the latter part about what they mean by trees. Uh, if, if, if they're talking about the expansion of, of, uh, of forests, Due to changing, uh, you know, our altering the fire regimes, um, we're still getting a, a, a grasp on what the extent of that really was, and that was probably that expansion was probably not super significant in terms of area. I think a bigger issue was um, the change in move, moving from uh, open canopy forests to more closed canopy forests. Uh, if the question was getting at changing harvest rates. That's uh, that's something I can't I, I can't answer. Um, I, I I don't under I, I haven't we haven't had any policy direction about changing harvest rates. Okay, perfect. Um, we have one more minute. I th that's all the questions that um, have come in so far. Oh, a couple more. So if we want to, if you don't mind, we we'll hang in there. Sure, yeah. We'll get no, the fine. last. You uh, answered here, if that's okay. So fragmentation of land base is an agriculture issue, but apparently also for for forests. At the white green boundary, what can we learn? Yeah, there's different kinds of fragmentation. So you have fragmentation that is. Uh, I, I was talking primarily a fragmentation within the forest landscape, which is often caused by harvesting. So this is a temporary alteration of the forest. By, uh, by harvesting, but the forest actually grows back. But um, when we get into the, that agricultural uh, forestry interface, that's fragmentation where we actually have a, a often you, a permanent loss of forest types and you have islands of trees left behind. And, um, and those are different kinds of fragmentation. One is a permanent fragmentation and one is a, a sort of a temporary fragmentation. And research has been done in both, both kinds of uh, situations. The, the land use conversion one is more significant in the long term because we found in those forest islands surrounded by uh, land use changes, um, you do have a, a change, a significant permanent change in uh, biodiversity. Sometimes it's actually an increase in species because of all the forest edges that are created, but it is a, a, a significant change. But in the areas where we're um, within the forest management landscape, where we're not seeing permanent changes, their fragmentation is often temporary, and the idea and and, and management can actually um, 
if it's done right, we can actually carry species through uh, the periods of disturbance to allow them to recolonize areas as they as they regrow, as long as we haven't separated, we haven't overly fragmented the landscape and extirpated uh, habitat types. So it's a, that's a very complex question, but it's a very interesting one too. Well, thanks for answering it the best you can with the limited time. Uh, the one last question I'll ask here is, if we uh, only suppressed fires around infrastructure, how will that change the forests? Uh, thinking around economic impact, cost of fighting fire versus loss of timber. Um, I, the fact that we're on the landscape does change things significantly. So we've already cleared certain areas for agriculture, so the forest extent is different than it was. And the fact is we do have human values. So um, I think understanding the natural range of variation of the complexity of ecosystems in the past can inform how we manage in the future. But uh, uh, we may want to spatially um, pattern that in a different way than nature would have done it. Because we're not going to want to see, you know, obviously large fires burning near communities. So um, even if that was the way the system happened in the past. so. Uh, maybe focusing some of these low severity type disturbances around communities, which are consistent with fire smart principles, would be a way of um, achieving both a fire smart objective, but also a biodiversity objective. It may be patterned in an artificial way, but um, it, it, it would be a balancing human and, uh, and biodiversity objectives. So um, yeah, it, it, does, it, does, it is different than nature was in the past, but I think it can be uh, consistent with uh, what I was talking about in terms of emulating natural disturbances. Okay, well, thank you so much, John, for your time and uh, presenting sustainable forest management from a bio biodiversity perspective today. I think uh, the number of questions definitely suggests that uh, folks are engaged and uh, interested in this topic for sure. Um, so in closing out, I wanted to remind everybody that this webinar was recorded and if you did register, you'll get an email with a link to the recording, but it will also be posted on Agriculture and Forestry Sustainability Webinar Series playlist uh, within the week or so. Uh, we do have two webinars coming up on November 26th. The Alberta chicken producers will be presenting, as well as December 10th, we have Field to Market Canada presenting uh, in the sustainability series here. I would uh, ask you to fill out the survey that comes right after you sign off or before you sign off, and that would be really appreciated. All right, have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you.